My name is Rafael Fernandez de Castro, I'm the director of the, of the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies at the University of California at San Diego. And I'm very pleased to welcome you all uh, to this uh, webinar, Poppies, Ports and Harm Reduction, the Changing Dynamics of Drugs Market. And uh, we have a very rich panel, and, and I want to thank all the panelists for, for being with us, for accepting our invitation. And first of all, let me introduce you to Ce Dr. Cecilia Farfan. Cecilia Farfan, is, is, uh, uh, she coordinates all the security programs at the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies, and she, she does much more than that, but uh, as such, I mean, she's, she's the one who put together this panel. I mean, she, uh, I believe this is a very important topic, it's, uh, and uh, here we are to have a serious discussion about how drug markets have, have been affected and what is the change in nature during this pandemic. So thank you, Cecilia Farfan, for putting this together. Uh, we have uh, five panelists, and we're very happy to to uh, to have you here. And uh, uh, Anna Sergei, she's a senior lecturer at the Department of Sociology at the University of Texas. She is the principal investigator of seaport and organized organized crime. She's an expert of, on ports, and, and of course, uh, that is going to be fascinating to listen to Joanna. And we also have Jaime Arredondo. I must say that Jaime was a, a fellow at the Center for U.S. Mexican Stories. He got his, his PhD here in UCSD, and he is a currently professor at CIDE, and he also participates in the British Columbia Center for Substance Abuse. And of course, he is now, as, his, as he just taught, just told us, he's bunkered down in Tijuana, and he's, of course, doing research in, in Tijuana. We also have Leo Belensky. He's a social epidemiologist who holds an interdisciplinary appointment in the School of Law and Health Sciences at Northwestern University, and he's also at, at UCSD Medical School. Thank you, Leo. Uh, thank you for joining us. We also have with us Roman Lecour, He's president and co-founder of La Noria. Uh, we, we, we just heard that Roman just finished his PhD and uh, he hasn't been able to defend because the university has been closed in France. <laughs> Congratulations, Roman. And Roman is, a, is, a, is a, I mean, he's going to be a, a senior fellow at the Center for U.S.-Mexican uh, uh, Relations. I mean, unfortunately, he's, going, he's not going to be a resident fellow, but we'll make him to come here once. Uh, we get over this pandemic. And uh, Roman, you're uh, such a good entrep entrep academic entrepreneur, uh, so it's very good to have you today. And, um, and let me uh, also introduce you with Diego Garcia Davis. Thank you, Diego, for joining us. Diego is a senior program officer for the Open Society Global Drug Policy Program. And he oversees the Latin American portfolio. He's um, uh, in Bogota, Colombia. And uh, welcome, Diego, for joining us. And thank you for your interest in our research and in this particular webinar. So let's, uh, let me give you the floor, Cecilia, so you could uh, tell us, I mean, what is what you have in mind? Uh, uh, how you see the trends going on? And, uh, and one of uh, the ideas is that uh, I believe that we should really try to strike lesson, track lessons from this uh, uh, emergency situation. Uh, this uh, drug market is something that has been affecting us for, for decades. Uh, and there's places like Tijuana and San Diego that we, uh, we're very affected by, by drug markets. So, I mean, what is, uh, uh, what, is what, you, what, what you had in mind when, when you put together this wonderful panel? And thank you, Cecilia, once again, for organizing this uh, wonderful webinar. Thank you, Rafael, and thank you to all our panelists for joining us today. We're very happy uh, to have you. Uh, so basically, we just wanted to continue and add to the conversation. Definitely, the pandemic has um, shed light uh, about criminal dynamics, and there has been a lot of discussion, for example, about favelas and how criminal governance has really, uh, you know, sort of uh, determined how uh, the behavior of people there, contrary to what the government is doing. We've also heard about, you know, care packages or narco dispensas in Mexico and what you know, criminal groups are doing, but we really wanted to add to the conversation and discuss other elements that we believe are 
uh, central for understanding drug markets that in general are, are not often discussed and definitely with the pandemic have not been uh, addressed. So we wanted to have a conversation about production, uh, ports, and also drug users. Um, I just want to be very clear that we don't see drug users as criminals and we certainly do not support punitive policies or criminal policies against drug users. We just wanted to take um, you know, COVID-19 as an opportunity to just discuss the entire array of activities from production, transportation to, you know, what's happening to drug users in the U.S. and Mexico. And so with that, I would like to start the conversation with Roman, who has studied uh, drug markets and specifically opium production in Mexico. There were definitely some very different dynamics when fentanyl was able to get into the U.S., but now we believe that that is shifting. So, Roman, can you tell us a bit more about, you know, the opium market in Mexico and how COVID-19 has affected what we're seeing on the ground? Uh, Roman, before you start, let me just tell uh, everybody participating, there's a Q&A button out there. Please use it. You could send questions and comments and, uh, and, and, and the, the panelists could take a look at it. If you want to answer them in writing, that would be fine. Otherwise, at the end, Cecilia and I will pitch you some questions. But, uh, but please, uh, for the audience, use the Q&A, send us comments, send us questions, and let's make this as interactive as possible. Sorry, Roman, for the, but let's go ahead. And I will ask you to, if you could turn off your, your mics uh, while you're not speaking, so because those, there's, a, there's a little bit of a noise out there, so please do so. Go ahead, Roman, por favor. Gracias. Um, thank you so much, um, Rafael. Thank you so much, Cecilia, for, for organizing and, and, and inviting me to this, to this panel today. Um, as, as Cecilia and, and Rafael said, I've been um, researching dynamics of violence in Mexico for almost a decade now, and um, I was mainly working on, on criminal organizations and dynamics of, of governance, and I started working on opium production um, about two and a half years ago. And it turned out um, that the, the issue is, uh, is quite revealing um, about other dynamics that we will go um, through today. And that the issue is quite complex as well, as, as you may imagine. So we turned it into um, a broader research program. So it's, it's both my individual research, but it's also a collective effort that we, that we have. Um, Cecilia is, is, is part of it and, and other colleagues. Um, at, um, at Noria and also in, in different universities. So to be, to be very concise, um, what do we know about opium production in Mexico? Um, to be absolutely honest, not enough, um, probably. So we, we, need to go, uh, we need to go local. Uh, we need to do more research in order to understand how it, uh, how it works and how it's been working and how the market dynamics uh, are, are working. So we, we, we need to go local uh, once again but we also need to produce um, more systematic um, knowledge uh, about it. The way we, we started uh, working on it was taking opium production and opium itself as an entry door to study uh, broader political, economic, social, cultural dynamics. Um, I think, and it, it's, 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 not very, it's not very original, but I think opium production in Mexico tells us um, a lot, but it hides a lot. Um, from us, again, in terms of social, economic, and political dynamics. In terms of violence, of course, and it's partly related to, to, drug, to drug trafficking, but not, the not, not only. So my, my point is usually to try to re-politicize drug-related issues in, in Mexico in order to take them out of the, um, of the narcos realm, to, 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 to put it that way, and to, and to study them in um, in, in, through the dynamics, again, and, and the effects they have on, on, on local communities. So regarding uh, opium production, it's of course part of a broader social, economic, and political dynamics. Uh, as I said, uh, opium production does not stand uh, on its own. It's part of a, of a social fabric, and we need, to, we need to understand it. Then, of course, there are market dynamics applicable to drugs in Mexico, very strong, and the most basic one maybe is demand, and this role goes massively to the US. Um, the, the opium production in, in that sense and drugs production in general in Mexico have uh, one big market, which is, which is the US. 
And in fact, what's interesting about opium uh, is that it was extremely profitable in, in, in Mexico for the past 20 years. When I say extremely profitable, I don't mean it uh, for the farmers. I mean it as a global uh, trend and a global economy. Of course, it's not as profitable as uh, for the farmer. But in terms of, of a global economy, it was, quite, um, it was quite profitable. And then two years and a half ago, three years ago, um, it became a rather fragile market in Mexico, in Mexico which is uh, extremely interesting because um, we usually take drugs as an always profitable economy. And, and, and in that sense, the Mexican case with opium has shown us how a drugs economy could collapse. And, and, and it almost collapsed. Uh, mainly because of transformations and, and evolution of demand um, in drunk, drug consumption in, in the U.S. So it almost became non-profitable two years ago when, when, when fentanyl massively um, spread in, in, in the U.S. and therefore made um, the demand for Mexican heroin uh, very weak. This have had um, very strong effects at the local level uh, in Mexico and very, very deep effects on the farmer's economy of these rural areas in Mexico. I have to say that um, opium is, is produced in at least five, uh, five Mexican states, mainly uh, Guerrero, Nayarit, Sinaloa, Durango, and Chihuahua. And in regions that are, that are extremely marginalized and extremely poor. So the, the opium economy is, is first and foremost um, uh, a survival economy for farmers in, in, in Mexico. And then it's a lucrative business for, for, for traffickers. But I think it, 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 really, it really should be um, seen that way, or at least it's the way we were trying to, to study it. So this is part of, um, of, our, of my uh, investigation and our group investigation, which means that we want to do field work basically um, and try to tie together the production, the trafficking and the consumption dynamics in one research initiative, basically tying the production of drugs in Mexico, the trafficking from Mexico to the US and the consumption uh, dynamics, a little bit in Mexico of course, um, but also, also in, the, in, in the US. And through the question of opium production, we will be able to discuss so many different angles of research, uh, among them criminal groups and, and governance, political power, social inequalities, gender dynamics, drugs policy, public security policies, and harm reduction, amongst uh, many others. What's interesting about the current dynamic and the effect of, uh, of the pandemic on, on all that, of course, um, well, first, um, as, I, as I said in an in op-ed we, we published with a, with a colleague um, in the Washington Post a couple of weeks ago, I think COVID as a social dynamic, as a social event and not a health issue is uh, what we call a revealer, something that actually shows us uh, what we already knew, but deepens what we already knew, meaning inequalities, First, um, second, how the Mexican state is dealing with marginalized rural spaces in, in the country and how these spaces try to adapt, protect themselves and survive, sometime through this illicit uh, economy, of course. So in that sense, although um, these territories are not always and, and not as much as on the, under the, the media as rather, um, COVID didn't bring any surprises to the local social economic effects on, on this population. It's a crisis on top of another crisis, ongoing crisis, social, economic, political crisis, and of course, the violent crisis. In terms of criminal activities and, and, and trafficking, in fact, and, and, and I, will, I will finish on this, I think it's, um, it's quite hard to go beyond um, assumptions. We have been observing several dynamics and different dynamics. Um, in terms of, uh, of criminal activities and trafficking, but I think we have to be extremely cautious, and we already discussed this with, with, uh, with other, other, other colleagues, we have to be cautious with correlations and causalities. Um, it sounds very cliche to say that, I, I know it, but correlation does not imply causality. And in that sense, um, I think what we have read or heard about the impact of COVID on criminal activities or criminal markets or drug production in Mexico is assumptions um, at best. Uh, first, 
we can we can talk about the the, the opium prices in in that case. Um, so it, it's it's been said that because of uh, the closure of of the ports and and Anna will will talk about it much better than than I do. But because of the closure of the ports, um, precursors and and chemicals from Asia couldn't enter enter Mexico, so Mexico could not produce um, synthetic drugs to the U.S. So the U.S. asked for more heroin. So farmers started. Um, planting opium again, basically. The thing is, this this perfect explanation is it's perfect and it's 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 interesting and and it probably had an effect, but the the temporalities uh, do not completely match actually. Farmers and and we had confirmed that on the field, farmer farmers were replanting opium before COVID start started hitting and before the ports were closed. So I, I'm I'm not saying that COVID didn't have an impact on the rest of the economy. But what I'm saying is that there is so much we don't know about those illicit markets that we can only um, be humble, I think, at, at, at the moment to, 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 to start studying it. The, the questions of ports are, are extremely, extremely interesting in, in that sense, but we have to understand how um, demand offer and, and demand is, is, is related in, in open markets and in, in Mexico. And what we're seeing today is um, the, the season of opium production, the first of the year, which started in January and ended up in, in April, has been more profitable than the one we were observing in, in 2019. So something is happening, something has happened. We have yet to see um, how long it lasts, of course, if, if the high prices of the, or the rela relative high prices actually uh, stand. But it's it's basically what we what we want to 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 research now. And and again, rega regarding the the impact of COVID on 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 ports, I think um, my colleagues will 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 be able to to say much more about it. What we're trying to do, and, and my conclusion will be, that uh, our research tries to go back to to this kind of of, of basics, right? Um, to document, describe, and analyze the social dynamics of drug production in Mexico, in that case, opium, and we need to produce way more knowledge on illicit cultivations and illicit markets in Mexico in order to understand um, the broader picture that, that, that we're trying to, to analyze. Thank you very much. Adelante, Ceci. Thank you. Thank you, Roman. Um, so we wanted to continue the conversation. So I agree with you. We don't really know much about opium and you know, this rural economy in Mexico and let alone what's happening at the ports. And so we wanted to, we wanted to have Ana because of course, when we discuss drug markets, there's really, there's a lot about, you know, there's some discussion about production there and there's drug users, but nobody really gets into how exactly drugs are moved, you know, besides what we see in pop culture. So Ana, if you could tell us more about what you have observed in ports, you know, what are, you know, especially talking about cocaine, which is a drug that you have studied, and are there any impacts that we can, you know, take away from COVID? Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for having me. It's a very interesting um, set of panelists. So, yes, it is correct. I have been working on um, cocaine trade for the past um, years. Uh, and I'm, I was just finishing a research, a research project, which now got delayed a little bit, uh, on uh, seaports, especially in North American Eastern Coast, uh, Montreal, New York, uh, Philadelphia, uh, for that side, and the European side of the story um, between Valencia, Liverpool, Antwerp, Rotterdam, Genova, I'm forgetting something. Oh yes, there is also Australia at some point, but that's another story. Um, so if we were to decide and define uh, what we know about the cocaine trade during COVID, I would echo what Romain said. We, at the very best, uh, have some correlations uh, and obviously a lot more needs to be done. Um, so the cocaine market is particularly interconnected with the legal economy. Uh, it abuses legitimate means of transport and distribution. We know that. We know that cocaine travels mostly by sea and by air, and actually uh, by, air, by air, not so much so, uh, as smaller loads are carried by human smugglers by air, mostly is carried through ships. Um, so the cocaine trade is inherently dependent on the inter intercontinental market and international trade. So that's the first thing to remember. There are a number of actors, uh, which uh, I apologize if this is obviously uh, obvious, but I just have to make a whole story here. 
a number of actors and networks, uh, starting from the importers, so people who actually have the money to finance the shipments, who are usually in uh, North America, uh, Asia somewhere, or, or Europe, depending. They could be anywhere and um, invest anywhere. Uh, the producers who are in a couple of uh, countries in uh, Latin America, namely Bolivia, Peru, uh, Colombia, um, and they li liaise with the traffickers uh, who are tasked by the importers uh, through brokers. Uh, these brokers are placed everywhere in, uh, in the West, let's say. Uh, the traffickers, depending on the routes, uh, are at this specific time, Colombian, Mexican specifically, uh, through Honduras, Guatemala, we'll, we'll get that in a second. Then you have the wholesalers who have the drugs uh, at the end. So they take the drugs when the drugs arrive in the destination country for the high distribution and the cutting of the shipments uh, and the distribution across the those who eventually will handle the dealing at the local level. So very much like um, on any other international business you can think of. So understanding the supply chain is paramount to understand how, what's happening now. So very quickly, because that's not my, my task today, uh, so we said that cocaine is mostly produced in Colombia, Peru, Bolivia. These countries have very different approaches to the market. Um, in particular, it is legal in Peru and Bolivia to cultivate coca plants privately. Uh, in Colombia, instead, the government, after the FARC agreement in 2016, has uh, had this wonderful idea <laughs> of swapping illegal crops for legal ones, which essentially resulted in the quadruplication of uh, cocaine production in, since 2016, more or less. Um, Colombia, during the co COVID, uh, we just heard from, um, I think, Diego, who is there now, so you'll hear that maybe later. Uh, the coca bush eradication program from the government has not, the campaign did continue during COVID. This has created some violence outburst. Uh, the only thing that has impeded production seems to be a shortage of gasoline, uh, which is usually smuggled from the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela and has been delaying production in eastern Colombia. Bolivia, uh, cultivation has been increasing, actually, because there's been some problem in the, um, let's say, control, uh, legal control of production in the past years, not just now. Uh, and the most interesting data we have is from Peru, whereby the VIDA, who is the, um, uh, uh, what's the English name for the VIDA, the National Commission for Development and Life Without Drugs, uh, reported in uh, late April that uh, a fall of uh, the price of cocaine, coca leaf and cocaine derivatives of almost half, so 48, 46% of drop in the price, which essentially means when a shortage of, of production is not recorded, so cocaine is produced, but there is a, a price drop. This means that um, there, is, there is a challenge, there is a blockage somewhere in between trafficking and, uh, say, and, and retail. So we need to get that. So moving to transport, um, generally speaking, the, the pandemic has not stopped cargo shipment. Cargo shipment has moved uh, as happily as before, transporting goods, uh, life-saving supplies, uh, essential items all remained allowed. So I'm just going to give you some details about ports to understand what exactly has happened. So maritime ports uh, have remained largely operational everywhere. Uh, between January and May, which is the latest details we have, uh, Port Economics, which is, um, a, a, you know, uh, a set of uh, colleagues who works on the economics of ports, essentially, um, they have redacted a number of impact barometers uh, for ports to try and understand what exactly has happened in different areas of the world. So we know, for example, that um, Cocaine shipments, um, just to give you an idea, have not only have arrived, but have arrived in even more, um, let's say, quantities than before and compared to last year. So most of the figures have uh, before. In particular, the port of Rotterdam and the port of Antwerp have uh, almost seen double um, cocaine shipment as they were used to. So this is interpreted as a sign that traffickers are currently risking more by sending larger quantities instead of parcelling it, their shipments to avoid detection. Uh, this, how this works on the other side, so on the side of Latin America, Latin American ports have not been heavily impacted actually by the 
in terms of cargo volumes, at least not until April. We don't know most recent data. In particular, what has happened is twofold. So on one side, uh, you have the Caribbean coast. So for example, the port of Cartagena in Colombia um, recorded an increase of 19% of total cargo during first semester uh, compared to last year. Well, the, por the port of Buenaventura, so the other side of Colombia, so the Pacific coast, um, has experienced a drop of 11%. Um, so this is due to a number of issues that have to do mostly with procedural changes, so port call changes. So you need to have more hygienic inspection, more distancing workforce, wor workforce. Um, some, people, some port workers were called in sick. So all these issues have delayed the port and some, in some cases have delayed the traffic, but the traffic has not stopped. Um, some uh, ocean carriers, like Maersk, to be specific, have replaced some of their um, long-haul shipments uh, and regionalized, regionalized them. So instead of running one service that lasted one month and touched upon the whole world, they have regionalized the services into small chunks. So from uh, Latin America, then another one from Latin America to North America, then another one from North America to Europe, which essentially has delayed things, but has not changed the actual movement. Um, so as I said, there has been some differences in the port uh, ability to handle this uh, from the different routes. I just want to share my screen here. Not, I'm not showing anything particularly interesting, just the map of the world, because I don't know how many um, of us are actually. So if we look at the, at the routes of cocaine through Peru and Ecuador and, uh, sorry, through Bolivia, Peru and Colombia, we have different, so the main routes are either through the Caribbean Sea, um, the, sorry, the Brazilian route through the South Atlantic Ocean, or obviously the, um, the sorry, okay, yeah, the Pacific route, okay? So the goes from, um, from Costa Rica to Guatemala through Mexico, uh, while the Caribbean Sea is the one that goes through Honduras, Honduras being a massive part of this in this stage. So if we consider what has happened from there, for example, uh, we can see that um, th there, are, there, are, there is some data that suggests that the Pacific route might have been more uh, impacted than the Caribbean route uh, when it comes to, uh, to, the, the, to this COVID situation in the ports. Um, and essentially what the, the adaptation of that has, has been a direct shipment of, co of cocaine from certain Latin American hotspots to Europe uh, through smaller vessels. Uh, so for, in May 2020, for example, we have seen some rising, um, let's say, cocaine seizures on board of small ships from Guatemala and Honduras uh, into the main port of Spain and Portugal, which essentially seems to confirm that. But then again, the correlation is not causation, so God knows what the hell is happening, um, really. So just to go towards the end, as I said, overall cocaine has arrived mainly through ports. Um, once in the port, cocaine usually is moved inland in a number of ways. Um, the old style, and I call it old style even if it's not old, it's still used, a uh, method of the rip on, rip off, where a large bag of uh, cocaine is placed at the at, in, inside the um, container without um, pretty much the carrier knowing about it is less and less used. Uh, what is preferred is to actually take the cocaine uh, inside the container outside the port through normal legal companies that are actually tasked, their freight forwarders, their task to go to the port, take the container and bring it somewhere else. The interesting thing about this is that during the pandemic, we have seen, according also to port economics data, um, that because of port, pro port procedural changes, increased hygiene inspection requirements, and da, 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 there have been a number of things that have affected the wholesale distribution. So obviously cocaine arrives, it needs to be taken somewhere so that it can be cut into small, smaller sections and given to the different distributors. Um, so different things have happened. So first of all, um, most ports have worked normally, as I said, two thirds of the port 
witness normal operations. Uh, not much impact in port workers uh, significantly in North America and Europe, but truck companies have been very affected by COVID-19. This means that in more than one country, especially in Europe, 50% of truck companies have been closed. This means that 50% less freight forwarders have gone to the port. So what has happened is that a lot of cocaine has arrived and has remained around the port area in what we know, what we call as um, warehousing essentially around the port before they could actually move anywhere else. So the container arrived and it was parked somewhere before someone could actually go pick it up and bring it to destination. So this has been the most interesting thing, I think, um, because it, it essentially means that now we have a reserve of cocaine that has arrived, has just not arrived to the final, final destination, but it is there. Um, and this is gonna be uh, used in the next month. I think um, we can read into this that um, some trafficking groups, some traffickers have used this um, uh, pandemic essentially uh, in the uh, anxiety that they wouldn't be able to um, to move cocaine, they have moved cocaine in large quantities to build these reserves at destination. Because at the low distribution level, um, things have been rough. Uh, cocaine demand has not, we don't know whether it, it has always been increasing or decreasing in some big cities like London, Toronto, Montreal, we have seen the price of cocaine increasing, which essentially means an uneven availability of the narcotic. It's complicated to get the narcotic in the hands of consumers even though we have seen this going back to normal, now that things are opening again and people can talk to their um, you know, dealers in a better way. There have been different ways to bring um, cocaine to consumers and that's, we can talk maybe about that, more about that. But essentially what is, what, the most interesting thing I think is that we port working in the normal way, trade working in the normal way, but um, what the mobility inside states being impaired, we have now a lot of cocaine are waiting to be distributed compared to what we could, um, we could have had in, the, in a normal, let's say, um, in, a normal, yeah, in a normal environment. But then again, we don't know enough uh, and we're still waiting for the data from May and June. Uh, so we need to see uh, where this is going, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, thank you for breaking uh, this very complex dynamic into smaller pieces. I think the points to raise are very important. It's certainly something that we should pay attention in the coming months, especially with this uh, amount of cocaine accumulating uh, in warehouses uh, at their points of destination. Let me shift gears now and let's look at the other side of drug markets and move on to discussing drug users. Um, Leo, so in general, when we think about drug users, we think about a vulnerable population. And reports coming out of the pandemic have, you know, signal that they may be even in more, they may be facing more challenges right now. Can you explain to us, you know, why in general they are a vulnerable population and, you know, what are we seeing as a result of the pandemic? I think you're muted, Leo. Okay, so we'll move on to Jaime, <laughs> who works very closely with Leo, and then uh, come back to Leo. Um, so, I mean, you work on harm reduction efforts. You work very closely with Leo, and right now you are in Tijuana, so you can tell us really a lot about what's happening uh, at the border. So, if you could, you know, explain for those in the audience who may not be as familiar with harm reduction, what do we mean uh, by that, and what are you seeing in Tijuana um, as a result of the pandemic? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, so harm reduction is basically a strategy on the public safe side, public uh, health side to prevent the harm done by substance use, right? So we don't judge substance use. We're just trying to minimize the risk of people who are using substances. So uh, we have several interventions like needle exchange, uh, safe consumption sites, opioid substitution therapy, and now we also have drug checking as a harm reduction strategy. 
So uh, I work in the border region, both in Tijuana and the city of Mexicali. And more than, uh, let's say, two years ago, approximately, we started hearing some experiences by the substance users on the streets about their dope being a little bit stronger than usual. And following that advice by Dr. Medina Mora, and then some knowledge that I learned while working in Canada, we started conducting some drug checking for fentanyl on the streets of Tijuana. And we found that the local drug supply was tainted with illegal manufacture of fentanyl. Uh, we were able to produce a report on it. And now we are trying to conduct more systematic uh, testing from time to time regarding the presence of these adulterants in the local supply. So what we have found is that in general, uh, China-wide is uh, adulterated with uh, fentanyl. And for those of you who do not know what fentanyl is, is basically a synthetic of uh, an opiate. And uh, the way that I put it up is that, you know, if you have the poppy and then you have morphine and, and then you have heroin and then you have fentanyl and then you can have even synthetics or uh, of, a scent of uh, fentanyl that are even stronger. So for someone who is not really well uh, accustomed to the strong potency of fentanyl, this can lead to higher risk of an overdose particularly in places like ours when we don't have access to the tools to prevent overdose like naloxone. So naloxone is a medicine that has been used now for a couple of years, uh, originally in the hospitals to reverse uh, the fentanyl, which is basically put you to sleep uh, during all the surgeries. Uh, but in the United States, they have been using it now in Europe as well to prevent people from dying from overdose. So we use these strategies to go out down to the streets of Tijuana and trying to help out the vulnerable populations. So I think something that uh, we need to recognize is that many of the people that we serve in the organizations that provide harm reduction in Mexico have already many vulnerabilities. They might be homeless, they might be deportees, uh, people with trauma. And sadly, uh, since last, uh, the, since the last administration uh, arrived in the federal level in Mexico, all funding for harm reduction was cut in the country. And this meant that there are higher risk of getting infected with HIV, Hep C, and now with overdose. So the organization that I work with, we basically provide these services for free uh, with the support sometimes of the state of Baja California, and other international organizations such as like the Open Society Foundations uh, or other collaboration with international organizations in the United States. Uh, so now what we're trying to understand is what has COVID, uh, how has impacted the lives of people that we uh, serve. Uh, I can tell you that as many of you have said, I think we need to be humble and trying to recognize that things are so complicated that we're still trying to understand what's going on out there, right? Why uh, substance users are not getting infected at uh, higher rates that we thought they would be, or maybe we are not detecting them. Uh, we can also understand that drugs have not disappeared from the streets of Tijuana. And I think uh, uh, Anna made a good point about warehouses and drugs being uh, waiting there until they cross. Uh, and I think, thank you for, for showing it. These are the, the slides from the organizations that uh, we work with. If you want to uh, donate, uh, welcome to, to contact me or the organizations directly. Uh, so really, we don't fully understand what is happening. The first uh, realization we made is that we needed to take certain precautions in order for minimizing the risk of getting infected with COVID, both for staff or for uh, the clients themselves. So using some uh, best practices from Canada and from the United States and other harm reduction international organizations, we modify our, our, our standard protocols and we try to use all the protection equipment that we can to provide the services. We don't want to become a vector for uh, the disease to the plants that we uh, attend, but also we set up some filters where we take the temperature, the oxygen levels, we ask the people that comes to do little exchange if they had any symptoms, if they know someone with symptoms, and now together with the city and the state, we were able to create a shelter 
for vulnerable people who is infected with COVID. This includes substance users, uh, people engaged in sex trade, also deported uh, migrants, and we're trying to do the community uh, detection of COVID. Now, the drugs have not disappeared from the streets of Tijuana or even in Mexicali. Uh, I think this is part because we are a warehouse, even though that people think that the border is closed, it's really not closed for citizens and people who has uh, work visas, so they continue to cross frequently between the United States and uh, Mexico. So probably the, the drugs are still going both ways. Uh, we also have tunnels, uh, so the drug trade continues. Now, what are the consequences for our clients and people who use drugs? One is that the, con the economic activity has impact everyone. So this means that also people who use drugs have more difficulty finding money to use uh, for uh, drugs that you know they sometimes need uh, a couple of doses a day, and now it's getting a little bit more harder to try to find that money. Uh, violence is still happening in Tijuana. As you know, we are an extremely violent city in Mexico. Uh, I think we have a homicide rate of 100 per 100,000, roughly speaking. So reality is still there. And I think uh, Romain, mean, uh, he did a really good point, which is COVID didn't make everything go away. It just emphasized the structural vulnerabilities that are out there. Uh, we are still continuing to see an overdoses uh, more prevalent than ever. Uh, COVID creates more risk because we need to be close to the person in order to help them save their lives. Uh, so it's a complicated situation down here in the border. I think that now what we need to understand is how to shift the conversation from COVID is something that is going to pass to something that is going to remain here for a while. And how can we better serve the population in order to protect themselves and the community in general. I think that sadly, the federal government has uh, engaged into a strategy that promotes just say no to drugs rather than a harm reduction approach that helps to save lives. So we have a national campaign that says fentanyl kills, uh, but unfortunately we don't have the tools to stop people from dying. And it's in these moments that I will encourage everyone to look abroad and trying to create networks with the organizations that are down here. Uh, most of the time, uh, we operate without money and volunteering, and the staff on the front lines are really heroes uh, that I admire and I'm happy to work with. Uh, we have learned a lot from knowledge exchange with places like Canada, where we have adopted some of the best practices, and now we just need everyone else to just come down here if they have a time, uh, check out reality and see how can they support. Uh, that's basically all I wanted to say. If you have more doubts, Preven Casa is the organization that is in Tijuana. We provide a needle exchange, a medical clinic for patients free of charge. And then in Berter in Mexicali, we have a safe consumption site only for women. It's the first and only safe consumption site in Latin America and only the fourth for women in the world. So I encourage you all to please visit their websites. And if you have more questions about local dynamics, please be happy to shoot me an email. Thank you. Thank you, Jaime, and thank you for, you know, in addition to your academic work for actually, you know, directly being involved with bringing home reduction strategies to, to Tijuana, a city that currently is the services. Leo, I'm wondering if your audio is working now? No. <laughs> can you uh, can you try and call in? And hopefully that that works. Yeah. <laughs> so Maybe if you want, I can fill up something that we're doing there while Leo dials in. I think... Uh, sure. Please, Jaime, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, I think uh, both uh, Leo and I, uh, together with other researchers, we just got a grant uh, from UCSD 
to do a fentanyl testing uh, project in Tijuana. The idea is to map uh, the presence of fentanyl across the city, as well as recording uh, together with uh, some students from UCLA and Professor Philippe Bourgeois, the ethnography experiences of people who use drugs uh, who are just getting to know fentanyl, right? As many of you know, uh, fentanyl is not new in the sense that Canada has seen uh, the use of fentanyl for more than a decade now. And now the United States is as well uh, seeing a drug supply tainted by fentanyl. So I think uh, Roman mentioned before about this need to try to understand the local dynamics. So that's basically what we're trying to do, right? Trying to understand how substances are being consumed in the city like Tijuana, but then also to trying to understand, uh, is this happening in the other side of the border? I think we always have this assumption that things and realities are different from one side to another. But my personal experiences from working in drug markets such as Vancouver or in Tijuana or seeing other places in the United States is that there are many realities that we share all across the countries and across the world, right? And one constant is the high vulnerability of people and the lack of information about what is in your drug supply that is driving these overdose cases up and piling up a double epidemic of overdose with COVID. Uh, so that's basically some of the collaborations we're doing with Leo. Let's see if he, he, he was able to join in on the phone. Uh, no, cannot hear you still. Ceci, so why don't we go ahead with Diego Garcia? And let me remind everybody that, I mean, we're open for, for, for uh, Q&A. So there's the, the, the bottom, uh, in the bottom of your screen. So please uh, uh, write your questions and we'll go, we will go right to it. Uh, go ahead, Diego, please. Rafael and Cecilia, thank you for the invitation. Um, and thank you for this, uh, as well to the Center for U.S. and Mexican Studies. It's probably the first um, webinar that we see uh, a, a compilation of all this expertise, looking at the different instances of the drug trade. Uh, so it's it's uh, excellent to see that we're looking at, at the at the whole picture. Um, now I've been I've been uh, asked by Rafael and, and Cecilia to serve as a discussant, which is obviously a challenging uh, role, uh, considering all the expertise uh, on the webinar and trying to comment on their work. So. Apologies in advance uh, to, to everyone that has done uh, so long and, and so in-depth research. Uh, probably my main take will be around the following, and it's the fact that we don't know enough about the drug uh, chain. Not, we don't know enough about the drug production, we don't know about drug trafficking, and we don't know about how drug is distributed and is used in urban settings. So those questions are still in place during the pandemic. Um, let me refer to a report that the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime uh, recently issued, uh, actually after the pandemic, uh, suggesting that the uh, lockdowns and strict quarantines have heavily impacted how drugs are being moved and actually uh, impacting on the amounts and the drug use on different streets, which again, hearing all the, all the researchers today, we know that that's not necessarily accurate. So this, base, this is basically a UN, uh, United Nations agency, uh, suggesting something that is not necessarily based on evidence. Um, and we need to look at that into more detail to um, actually uh, suggest, define policies that re uh, respond to the, to the reality. Now, Trying to move to each of the of the presenters today, I like to refer to um, Romain's point that we don't know enough about uh, opium poppy uh, production in Mexico, uh, and the suggestion that this population should be also be considered not criminals but rural uh, population farmers that should be looked from the rural development perspective. So if the Mexican government wants to be true uh, to the fact that they want to include this population in, in, a, in a more comprehensive policy, they should 
uh, allow and look at this issue from the road development perspective and not from the tunnel perspective. So we are seeing and, and uh, the Romain's suggestion that, that these communities should be decriminalized, which are depending on a survival economy, as, as uh, Romain uh, very well described. I, I agree with, uh, with Jaime's comments on, on uh, um, uh, Romain's point about the fact that the pandemic is actually a revealer. A, a revealer. We don't know enough. Uh, the correlations and causalities might be there and are sort of sexy to, to uh, publish reports from the UN perspective, but we again need to test that those hypotheses uh, out there. Um, it's, it's again too soon to declare that the, the drug production and drug chain has been uh, disrupted only in three months. I agree with Anna as well with Jaime and Romain's comments that the supply and as well as demand also relies on stockpiles, for instance, uh, warehouses, not only on raw materials, uh, which, which happens with coca and cocaine, but also with opium poppy and heroin, uh, as well with fentanyl. Uh, so that's, uh, again, bringing questions uh, uh, about our fully understanding on how the drug chain operates. Uh, how the roles are, are divided and where uh, we should look, be looking at and where are the voids on information. Um, so this, this is telling us that basically the drug chain overall is resilient, it's highly adaptable. Uh, it has been adapting over f uh, four or five decades to the so-called uh, drug war. And uh, it's not an exception that the drug chain and the drug market, market is adapting to this new reality. I'd like to comment specific, specifically on, on, on Anna's point around the increasing cultivation in Colombia of, of coca plants, which is the raw material to produce cocaine, uh, is not necessarily only related to the peace agreement between the, the Colombian government and the insurgency FARC. Uh, it, it has also other variables uh, um, promoting that production, which is, for instance, the drop on prices on oil, and gold, which uh, many of these communities depend on, on, on illicit mining of gold or artisanal mining of gold as well. Um, the drop of uh, the uh, price of dollar as well. So that made, that impacted the, uh, and increased the production of uh, coca plants, basically. Um, now, I, I fully agree with, with, with Anna's point that on the fact that most of the of the sea routes, the licit sea routes are still in place, as well as the as the informal routes. As as you might know, many of the cocaine is also transported in a sort of artisanal vessels. Uh, um, submarines or or even artisanal fishermen are taking um, cocaine into the international waters. So those routes are still in place. So again, it's too soon to say that the, that that. Uh, um, market and that supply has been disrupted by the pandemic. Um, also appealing and, and, and commenting on, on Jaime's point of harm, relum, of harm reduction as a principle um, that should be applied to other trenches of the drug supply chain. Uh, instead of looking at that as, a, uh, as, as those communities that depend on uh, opium poppy growing or even small drug sellers that are non-violent sellers uh, should be looked from the harm reduction principle instead of uh, from the criminal and penal perspective. Um, there are many questions, and I, again, I agree with Jaime's point on, uh, around drug users, especially homeless drug users not being uh, uh, affected by the pandemic, or yes, we don't know. And th those questions need to be asked by, by local administration. Um, and, and again, uh, Jaime is supporting the idea that, uh, for instance, Tijuana is a warehouse of drugs and, and those, that stockpile is still supplying drugs uh, uh, to the north and as well domestic. Um, so mainly the question is how to serve the population that's been affected by the pandemic and it's constantly affected by the drug uh, war that is criminalizing their activity, like farmers, uh, drug users and petty drug sellers, uh, how to shape policies uh, to this new reality. And that's probably my, my 
my question to the panel, and, and let me close with, with a couple of, of questions to ignite the conversation after Leo uh, brings his thinking. Um, what sort of information each of you will say it's missing to better understand the drug trade overall and to formulate policies that respond to the reality? Again, we're seeing UNODC promoting forced eradication as Anna is saying, and the Colombian government is following the, uh, that guidance very closely, and the result is, is basically uh, heartbreaking. Over the last four weeks, the Colombian government con uh, continues to conduct forced eradication campaigns of coca crops, which again is the survival economy of those uh, communities, and with, within those campaigns, so as a result of those uh, forced eradication campaigns, at least four farmers have been killed by the Colombian army. So again, if we continue to uh, formulate and conduct policies as they have been over the last few decades, we'll see the same result. We shouldn't expect the same result, a different result by implementing the same policies. That's my, my last comment then, and, and basically uh, questions to the rest of the panel. Thank you, Cecilia and Rafael. Cecilia, you wanna... We're not listening to Cecilia. And, uh, there so we go. Not... No. <laughs> okay, go ahead, thank Cecilia. Thank you. No, thank you, Diego. I'm wondering if uh, Leo um, was able to connect with us. We can't uh, hear He's you. He's going to call me, and I'm going to put it on the speaker. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. Ready. Me. Don't worry about it. Technology. Technology. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can we hear him? Can you yeah. all hear me now? Yes. Okay, we have the system. I'm so sorry, I don't know what's going on, but anyway, we made it work. Um, so I'll make my comments brief. Thanks so much for organizing this. I'll make my comments brief. Um, <clears throat> still, you asked me to talk about. Um, vulnerability of people who use drugs uh, in the context of COVID-19. And I think Jaime is actually, in some ways, this was a better word because Jaime has already, has already covered a bunch of the um, kind of biological elements of that. So, um, you know, the context, of course, is that we were already in a, in a crisis before this, uh, this pandemic hit. And that crisis related to the vulnerability of people who use drugs to overdose, to infectious disease, and um, the, the pandemic has exacerbated that vulnerability. But I wanted to speak more. Um, Leo, the audio yeah. is, is hard to listen to you. Uh, okay. Why don't you try to, to, I mean, to make a one or two minute comment because it is hard to listen to you. So if you could really go yeah. to the door of your comment and then we will open up, uh, uh, please, Leo. Sounds, sounds good. The overarching comment that I wanted to make is that our, our collective vulnerability to COVID-19 um, being exacerbated by the war on drugs and that includes elements such as the um, movement of security forces related to drug law enforcement, which can act as a vector of disease transmission. That also includes the vulnerability of people who use drugs to criminal justice involvement um, including incarceration, but also arrest. These are hotspots for COVID-19 transmission. Um, so the drug law and law enforcement essentially acts as a facilitator of epidemic and, and pandemic spread. More, more structurally, I think that there's a conversation that we have to have about the ways in which um, the drug war uh, metastasizes and changes investments in systems of care and support versus um, systems that are built as public security but really provide no public security benefit. 
So the militarized policing on both sides of the border and elsewhere in the region, um, investments in prisons, investments in other carceral systems crowd out investments in support systems, health systems, public health prevention. And we see this on the ground, you know, in our work with Jaime in Tijuana, where, you know, the healthcare system and the system of social support is very, very poorly funded. And in in the case of harm reduction is not funded at all. At the same time as, you know, there's cavalier continued investment in, in policing and prisons, um, and other areas of the security apparatus. Um, so I think COVID-19 provides us with an opportunity to rethink what we mean by public safety and to, um, redesign these systems that are supposed to protect communities, but in fact are more security theater than anything. And in time of crises, um, exacerbate vulnerability, um, that we see uh, happening on, on a wide scale. So uh, I'll stop my comments there. Well, go ahead, Cecilia. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you, Leo. I'm glad we were able to figure something out, even if it wasn't um, ideal. I wonder if the panelists would like to answer uh, Diego's question for you, and I'll also add a couple that we have been uh, getting. I, I saw that some of you have been answering um, online, so I appreciate uh, you also taking the time to do that uh, while presenting. So I'm wondering to what extent are we, what are the challenges when we say that we want to have a local perspective, but then try to have a general view uh, of the drug trade, are, are they compatible? How is it that we can, you know, make those work? And so if you would like to go ahead and, and you know, answer those questions. <laughs> sure, I, I, can, jump in. Yeah, I can, I can think of two measures that we will definitely could use. One is the number of overdose data, right? Sadly, Mexico does not really combine well overdose data through their national statistics. So we don't know the magnitude of substance use uh, fatal overdoses because we don't record them and we, we don't record them, they don't exist. So it seems similar to a COVID case, right? We don't have COVID because we don't do testing. So if we don't have overdose numbers, there's not a drug problem. And the second one is related to good practices such as uh, the ones developed in Canada regarding drug checking. So community drug checking can be present in any place that people use substances. But the important about it is how do we make that information publicly available? So for example, the, the British Columbia Center of Substance Use, when I have the opportunity to collaborate, we have a website, uh, I encourage you to check it, it's BCCSU drug checking, and you can find all the data regarding drug checking. So people can understand the local dynamics on how the drug supply is tainted and do better informed decisions about what they plan to use. So if you ask me, I will go for those two uh, pieces of data. Roman. Thank you, Cecilia. And, and to answer um, your question, Diego's question, and and um, and Patrick's questions on on the um, on the Q and A, uh, which are which are uh, quite related. Um, well, I think regarding um, Patrick's question, and, and it goes to to Diego's and and, and yours, Cecilia. It's um, the way the way we're trying to articulate the local scale with um, more systemic uh, data and, and and research, I think, I think the, the the first thing is, as we all said, actually uh, there is a lack of information, right? So we need to produce more information. The the first information we need to produce, from my perspective, but also from my capacity, because it's it's it's, it's what what I'm able to do is um, qualitative information. I think it's it's particularly important, crucial to have this qualitative inf 
information to actually be able to make um, Diego's comments on the UNODC reports, for example, and, and, and to break some, some narratives on drugs, drug trafficking, drug, drug, drug consumption, drug policy, drug production, all that stuff. What, what Diego was saying about the, about the UN reports, if we don't have the qualitative information to discuss it and, and not, not criticize it because it, it's coming from an institution or from a point of view or anything, but just to discuss it, we need qualitative information because otherwise the narratives will stay as COVID did um, this and this and this, right? And, and we, can't just, we can't discuss it, so the, the narrative stays and it becomes a truth and, and to overcome that kind of truth is extremely complicated because I think in terms of illegal, illegal markets and drug markets, the, the truth is, is usually built and presented by very powerful organizations or governments, basically. And to overcome those narratives, it's, it's quite hard. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying we don't have to trust the, those narratives. I'm, I'm saying we need more information to, to discuss them and make them richer, right? So I think that the first one is, um, qualitative information from the ground. And I think we all share kind of this methodological uh, point of view here, um, at least from, 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 from the people I, I, I know directly, is that basically we need, we need to go um, to the areas uh, where we want to get the information as much as, as we can. Of course, it's, it's sometimes hard, sometimes dangerous and everything, but um, get reliable and cross-checked information. I think it's, it's probably basic, right? And then the way from our point of view we're trying to systematize this information is again to to be able at least to have um, a time span that allows us to to get qualitative information during enough time to to actually get systemic information meaning for example we need to uh, be able to track opium prices in mexico year after year season after season region after region because it, it, it evolves through time and through regions. And, 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 and we don't have the, the, the prices yet. We don't have um, the actors that are, that are produced in, in Mexico. It's hard, but, but maybe we can, we can get them. We don't have um, the data on the, um, the eradication, the fumigation, the destruction of, of, of illicit cultivation in Mexico. We don't, we don't have them systematized. And because we don't have them systematized and we, we are actually working on it, we can't really put this question onto the public debate. So basically in Mexico, compared to Colombia, for example, and, and we've had the, the, the discussion with, with Diego and so many other Colombian colleagues, in Mexico, the question of opium production and eradication, fumigation, destruction is not a public debate, actually. It, it's a question that comes and goes depending on, on news, usually depending on news of violence. Uh, narco violence usually brings a lot of attention to, 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 to puppy. But other, other than that, we don't have, uh, we don't have the, this kind of information. So, so we're trying to get qualitative information to build as much quantitative information as we can as well and, and produce database. Uh, it's hard, but, but we're, uh, we're working on it. Um, so we have a better picture of, of, of what's going on. And, and, and I think it goes to, to, to Diego's question and, 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 to, and to Cecilia's question. Like, what sort, of, what sort of, of information do we need to formulate new policies? And, and how do we go from local to, to global? I think, I think it's, it's that kind of issue. It's basically we need more cross-checked, evidence-based information so we can actually at least propose, design, and, and maybe at some point implement policies that will actually be based on, on this evidence and not just on narrative that, that usually come and go um, from, from, from dubious uh, perspectives or, or at least dubious me me methodology. So, so we need to be able to, to, to discuss that. So, so I, I think it's, it's this articulation between the local and the global um, by making and producing more, more knowledge, more reliable information. And this information must be available to um, as much people as, as possible so the information can, can be treated in, in, in different ways and add methodologies and add information and add um, cross-check information. If I can come in on this, um, I totally agree with Please. Romain. Um, I think from the side of cocaine uh, trade knowledge, uh, um, and at least from the port perspective, what is missing is an understanding of ports. Um, so it's always very easy 
to say, okay, so this, you know, you, you arrive at the port, you ship things through one place to the other, but what I found when you actually enter the port in terms of actual field work in the port, um, there, is, there are so many competing agencies, uh, of which most of them are private agencies, so the private sector business owners who, uh, whose obvious business is to make money out of trade. Uh, so their interest is, yeah, security fine, as long as security involves um, an enhancement of reputation. So let's put in some security measures so that the port of Antwerp is seen as secure. That's the only benefit of it. But other than that, no one really cares as long as things don't, do not happen on the terminal and they happen elsewhere, who cares what travels on the containers? So in my case, what I found extremely useful in my, so I'm a criminologist, so I approach the, the phenomenon from the crime perspective, which is obviously one perspective, not the best one necessarily. I found it much more useful to look at data on port economics rather than, um, and trade, for example, in, in, in COVID, because those data is more reliable than anything else on the black market that clearly we don't have. <laughs> so for me to say, to see that the trade, the cargo volume in the port of Cartagena has gone up has more meaning than to say, oh, you know, the, the, the traffickers and the producers are trying to do their best and adapt. So what I know is that it's 19% more cargo trade in Cartagena in those months, which eventually means something also for the legal trade as much as the legal one. So I think on the side, on the criminological side, uh, a lot of is uh, remains to be understood in the way the, um, at least for ports in the destination countries, at least I haven't looked at the ports in the, unfortunately not yet, uh, in, the, um, in the production and the mo trade uh, mobility countries, but in the destination countries, what is essentially missing is an understanding of how border force seizures in, in, are somehow involved with uh, cross country, um, let's say, conversations. Um, just to give you an example, everyone is very concerned about inbound trafficking, what the hell is coming in. No one cares about outbound. So whatever gets out of the port of Melbourne, who cares, it's someone else's problem. So there is a program in the UN, which is a very, you know, as, as always, as many things in the UN, a lot of good intentions, but obviously very difficult to pick up, which is the container control program, whereby in, in theory, there's, if we have a control on what comes in and what gets out of port, we should be able to match but we are not there. Um, no one cares what gets out, everyone cares what gets in, uh, and this is a problem in intelligence. I think the conversations across ports uh, is absolutely broken. Um, no one cares about how ports connect to each other for the illicit uh, trade. Uh, all they care about is obviously how they talk for trade purposes, for the illicit one. So I think using that data, the illicit date data, is for me more uh, a stepping a step in point, but definitely we are not at the point where we have cross-country um, ability. This is for the bigger purpose. At the local level, it's phenomenal because actually the moment you step into a port, every port apart from the exterior, everything looks the same. So it's the purest form of global liberal market. They all look the same. They are all fantastically with Maersk and, uh, and containers. Everyone uses the same type of business model. Very few things change. So it's actually phenomenal to see how it, you know, Every port thinks they are special, but they are really not. But that's, that's another story, I guess. Um, but I think in that sense, um, the culture of each port is connected to the city behind the port. Uh, and that is another point that we don't have. Um, just uh, to finish with an example, Montreal, um, whoever uh, has been to, has have anything to do with Montreal law enforcement, you know that they have um, obviously Montreal city police, uh, Quebec police, uh, and so provincial police, and then the federal police, the federal police, which is a port enforcement team, which looks at illicit trade through the port, but then in the port there is a security team, and the security team has another security team somewhere else and essentially what happens is that you have 700 people looking at the same thing but no one really is looking together. 
So they all look at it, but they don't look at each other. So in, the, in this sense, the Port of Montreal is, um, so what falls through the crack is the city groups and their hold onto the port. So the city police sees the group in the city, but the moment they enter the port is someone else's jurisdiction. So it becomes someone else's problem. So the breakdown of the port city interface for the cocaine trade. So what the hell happens when cocaine arrives? Um, it's, it's puzzling how many law enforcement agencies are not asking the right questions. So it looks like cocaine just drops out of the sea and then, oh, we have these big <laughs> players in town and they deal with cocaine. Yeah, but where is this coming from? So I think there is a lot to, to be done there, which has to do with port economics um, and the city economics with the port. But then again, it's not a criminologist job, so I'm not quite sure I can even understand half of it. But that's, <laughs> that's just beyond the point. Ceci, so, so there's a, if you don't mind, there's a, there was a question comment uh, in the Q&A and somebody, uh, I asked uh, him or her uh, for his name or her name, but she has an answer. But basically it was, I believe, thoughtful and honest comment saying, I may be wrong, but I believe that the governor of Andres Manuel López Obrador is not trying hard uh, to stop drug trafficking because this is a huge business for Mexico. Uh, I believe it's wrong. Uh, I believe that, uh, 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 that I'm not defending drug policy by Andres Manuel López Obrador of a security policy, but I don't think it really has to do with the business. And, uh, and uh, I believe when we don't see these strong-handed policies, then we believe that we're seeing weak leaders on this. So I, I mean, we have a very thoughtful uh, panelist. What is your take on this? And, and, and uh, we, you all recognize that COVID-19 continues to be very uncertain. Uh, we don't know many issues yet. Uh, and, uh, so uh, let me ask you, wh wh what will be, uh, and, uh, and the time is approaching uh, to the end, so uh, uh, what is your take? I mean, how this uh, COVID-19, uh, what, what will be the lesson, one or two lessons that you will take out of, co of this emergency situation to come out after COVID-19 with a more robust, uh, intelligent, sound, uh, 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 drug policies. So uh, I wonder, says, if you want to, to, to add something to, to, to my questions. We have a very thoughtful panelist. So, so what would you ask them uh, to have a, a, a last round of, of, of interventions by all of them? Uh, no, I think the question that you asked is already pretty uh, complex, <laughs> and so I'll, I'll let them <laughs> I'll let them answer uh, that one. What will, be your, what, what, what will be your take, Leo? <clears throat> Hi, can you put me on speaker? Yep. Great. Um, I mean, I think one element that's really critical is actually building off of what Anna just talked about, which is that um, you know, in addition to the jurisdictional issues, the broader lesson from trying to control the drug trade um, in a globalized world in which we live has proven to be um, unsuccessful. And in many ways, this also highlights the reason why COVID-19 has become a global pandemic. We live in a global village and we need much more cooperation and coordination and we need stronger global systems to promote public health this applies to covid this also applies to the drug control regime um, i feel like both the public health system and the drug control systems are, are built on outdated notions of how you know kind of the city state framework functions and that we can you know, essentially stop things at our borders and we clearly... Unfortunately, we lost Leo, I think so. Oh. No, we, we can hear him. Yeah, yeah I'm Go sorry. Ahead, Leo. I, I was the one with the problem. I'm sorry. It was my internet, not Leo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Go, Leo. Okay. Sorry. Um, so, so in addition to thinking about, <clears throat> or I guess in the context of thinking about structural vulnerability, um, our structural vulnerability is that we don't have you know, strong global institutions um, that are focused on public health. 
we also, again, you know, to focus on what Romain and Anna was saying, I think that the metrics and the data, as, as Jaime outlined, are very important because in the context of drug policy, we have a lot of metrics that are operational metrics that are not actual public health metrics, like, you know, whether or not drug law and its enforcement are related to improving public health outcomes rather than, you know, looking at things like seizure data, which are really an operational metric that is, is extremely vulnerable to fluctuations that are not related to health at all. Um, so, so building up, I think in this conversation about global institutions, I think building up better surveillance and more meaningful surveillance is part of that. Um, and, uh, you know, rather than focusing on trying to push a rock up the hill of, you know, um, sort of chasing drug trafficking, dra drug trafficking organizations around the globe and suppressing supply in ways that, um, have never been sustainably successful. I think that the, the lessons from COVID are the same as they are for, um, drug policy, which is that we need to recenter, um, health prevention and invest in prevention and best in robust health systems and addressing structural vulnerability that make people, uh, more, uh, likely to suffer from infectious disease and addiction. And, um, um, you know, there are some, there are some kind of hopeful signs that those conversations are, are starting to percolate um, in the U.S. at least, and somewhat in Mexico, there's been a lot of attention to the continued abuses perpetrated by security forces um, about reforms. Unfortunately, you know, a lot of the conversations stop at kind of technical issues around, you know, police governance and other other um, you know technocratic fixes that I feel like are not getting to the root. Of the problem, which again is, you know, investing in systems of care, support, and prevention rather than in the security apparatus, quote unquote. Thank you, Leo. Uh, uh, very thoughtful. Thanks a lot, uh, Diego. What, what would be your take? And no, Rafael, uh, you're, you're in the midst of a lot of conversations, so I mean. Uh, what is next for us? If you could give us an idea, I mean, what 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 should be our next webinar regarding this uh, issue? Right. <laughs> well, it made them, well. Let me answer that that that, that <laughs> uh, last question, which is very complex. But also to the to to the person that posed that very honest honest question in the following way: It's not that uh, Amlo is not doing uh, enough. Is the fact is that he's doing the same that all governments have been doing over, over decades. He's, again, uh, militarizing public security. Uh, during his campaign, he promised to regulate the cannabis market and actually look into the possibility of regulating the production of opium poppy uh, for, for medicinal purposes, which ha the, the government hasn't advanced on those ideas. But, it, but yet, the US government, uh, the US administration, and the Mexican government are continuing their forced eradication campaign are uh, co continuing to detain people for drug use and drug possession, which has a massively impact on uh, incarceration rates. And again, we're seeing in Mexico already uh, a spread of the of, uh, pandemic or contagious within, the, within, uh, within prisons. Again, uh, the, the Mexican uh, government promised the, uh, an amnesty law that might favor those uh, low level non-violent drug offenders and only 7% of the total uh, uh, incarcerated population might be uh, benefited by, by the uh, new amnesty law. So, so again, the point is that uh, it's not that AMLO is not doing enough, he's doing basically the same that all the governments have, have done and he's not complying necessarily with what he has promised uh, in his campaign. So my suggestion is how to innovate in drug policy in Mexico, looking at AMLO's uh, promises. And I fully agree with, with Leo's, Anna's, uh, Romain's, and others' uh, suggestions on the fact that we are probably measuring 
uh, drug policy success using the wrong metrics. Uh, I fully agree with Anna, uh, criminologists should have sort of a, a ceiling on, on their analysis and we should be looking uh, and bringing all their expertise to look at, at, at this issue and how trafficking moves. The same with, with the opium poppy production. Uh, we're looking at this from, again, the criminal perspective and not from the rural development perspective. So I think we should bring other ex expertise to the table to formulate policies and uh, measure success differently. Thank you very much, Diego. We have uh, three, four minutes to go, so why don't uh, each one uh, of you, Anna, Jaime, and, and, and Roman, take one minute and then you will close, I see. So, Jaime, Leo, uh, 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 sorry, Jaime, Roman, and Anna, and then Cecilia. Yeah, thank you, Rafael. So, thank you all of you for, first of all, organizing, and it's a privilege to be here on, on, on this Zoom. And I just wanted to say that I think the lesson that we need to take is that harm reduction is saving lives, and either without COVID or with COVID. You know, now, now that we have COVID, what we tell our clients is don't share. If you're going to use uh, a pipe, don't pass it on. It's the same thing that we said before. Uh, like uh, if you have a syringe, don't share it, right? Uh, so basically, we're trying to uh, solve issues that we've been dealing with for many decades now. And it seems like we're going in the wrong steps, taking down harm reduction out of the way, when we should bring harm reduction to the center of uh, the public epidemic of uh, COVID and overdose and substance use. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We just need to make it more robust. We need to pump air into the, into the wheel and let us ride uh, all the way up because that's the only strategy forward. Thank you, Jaime. Roman. Thank you, Rafael. Um, I think, I think um, go, going back to the, to the COVID crisis, I think, I think we, 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 we said it. Um, I really believe it's, it's one health crisis on top of other structural crises, and it's crucial to, 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 rem to, to remember it. And it means that um, it will last because the health issue is one, and it might uh, be short, hopefully, but the socioeconomic effects of, of the health crisis will, be, will last for a long, 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 long time, right? So maybe not so much for illicit economies, because as we said, it's usually adaptable and, and quick to adapt, but the rest of society in which it's immersed will, will suffer a lot. So if, if I go back to my, to my case and, and opium production in Mexico, and it relates to the question on the security strategy of, of AMLO, um, since AMLO security, security strategy is pretty much business as usual, with some minor differences, well, farmers, that are producing opium in Mexico will suffer as usual from the security strategies and militarization of, of, of the country, plus the violence exerted onto them by so many different political actors and criminal actors. And then they will suffer a lot more because of the probable economic recession that Mexico will face um, soon enough. So I, I think it's, it's probably not um, very optimistic, but it, it's, it's most likely what we're uh, observing now. Thank you, Roman. One minute, Anna, please, and then yes, we'll go. Well, to... I'm even more pessimistic, I guess. Uh, so <laughs> cocaine is going to go back to normal, nothing to say there. Um, the demand of cocaine is not going down. Uh, there is nothing, nothing to believe that it, this is going to end. If not, it's probably going up. So that's on the side. I think uh, when I'm not wearing the hat of the port, security side, I'm a mafia researcher. So I think in that sense, um, what we can expect in the illicit economy, uh, in the illicit economy and the crisis, the economic crisis that the pandemic is likely to leave us with is an increase in the um, direct entry of illicit funds into illicit economy. So that's uh, happened before, it's gonna happen again. So corruption in one sense, more systemic ways of corruption are going to be uh, my, probably my next <laughs> interest in this in these things. Um, money from cocaine is always gonna be there, is, is a lot of money. This money is going somewhere and it's going somewhere where during a crisis a lot of people will not look too much where the money is coming from and i think that's probably even more pessimistic just to leave us on an happy note and uh, i'm done and thank you so so much for this i learned a lot cecilia you're close um